Economies around the world are in turmoil. Good evening, I'm Jamie Ho, and welcome to Singapore Votes, the political debate. Tonight, we have with us representatives from the four political parties fielding the most candidates in these elections. Now, from the People's Action Party, which is contesting every seat, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan, welcome. Good Dr. Balakrishnan is also contesting his seat in uh, Holland Bukit Holland Tima. Uh, from the opposition, we have three parties, from Progress Singapore Party, Mr. Francis Yuan, who is also contesting in Chua Chu Kang GRC. From the Workers' Party, Dr. James Lim, who is in the new Singkang GRC. Nice and from the Singapore Democratic Party, Dr. Chi Soon Juan, who will be at Bukit Batok SMC. Thank you. Now, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you again for being here tonight. The rules for tonight are quite simple. Uh, in, the first question, in the first segment, I will ask three questions for all parties to answer in turn. The opposition parties will share half the time and the PAP will have the other half. My first question is this, and Mr. Yuan, you will have the opportunity to answer first. Okay. The first question, and I shall go, goes like this. How would your party deal with rising unemployment, create jobs for Singaporeans young and old, and ultimately improve the lives of Singaporeans despite the bleak economic outlook here and around the world? You have a minute and a half. Your time starts now. Okay, thank you very much for the question. I think there are a couple of uh, aspects to this problem. One is that we need to make sure that Singaporeans get priority in, in jobs. We have a situation now where we have the PMETs, a lot of foreign PMETs working here. I think there are about 400,000 of them. And yet we have about more than 100,000 of these PMET that are out of job. Uh, therein lies a possibility of making sure that we have to ease off and release some of this job in the shortest time possible to ease out that problem with the unemployed PMET. We believe that we, we need PMET, this foreign PMET to complement, but we do believe that there is opportunity for us to slow it down. The other aspect is we make sure that the SME, SME who are in, which is the engine of growth, that employs 70% of our workforce, continue to become a strong engine of growth, the backbone of our economy. So they have to survive, they have to prosper, so the employment continues to be available for the younger people to come into the workforce and our existing workforce too. And for the older folks who are in the, in the, in the workforce today, the, the job training no doubt could help them, but we have to make sure they have given opportunity to move on to the new normal where business is going to change. Some of the business may not even come back at all. So we have to do a multi-pronged angle to tackle these three different areas of the problem. Very good. Uh, Dr. Lim, you have a minute and a half as well. Your time starts now. Thank you. So I'm going to start by pointing out that um, from a macro perspective, certainly, given that this is the worst pandemic that we are experiencing, perhaps, in, in our lifetimes, one of the, the biggest challenges to our economy since uh, independence, it is critical that we do not... Uh, hamper the economy in any way by doing something like raising taxes. So we, exp we understand that there are plans to roll out uh, an increase in GST, and of course that will come after the pandemic, but if we believe, uh, and we have been significant uh, evidence to believe so, that if this, this uh, contraction will be prolonged, then I think the idea of raising taxes uh, at this time will be very uh, counterproductive from a cyclical perspective. Uh, and then when it comes to jobs, I th the Workers' Party at least believes that it's not just sufficient to have jobs. Of course we want jobs, but we want good jobs. Jobs that uh, will enable workers to work with dignity. And for that, uh, we have proposed a number of proposals along those lines that we believe uh, improve uh, the quality of work. Well, one example is a national minimum wage, so we're proposing that. Uh, and, and we believe that that will lift wages in the heartlands for $1,300. And then uh, the other is a redundant insurance, the idea that you'll pay $4 a month and you'll get a payout of 40% of your last drawn salary uh, for six months after you're rendered redundant. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Chi Sun Juan, you have one minute and a half. Your time starts now as well. We've, we've got to stop this foolishness of, of continuing to bring in foreign workers, especially foreign PMETs, when we have more than 100,000 unemployed people in Singapore at the moment. Right? If you throw in people who just stop looking for, for jobs already, you, you, you're talking essentially uh, a lot more people here without employment. And then you talk about people who are unemployed. 
So when you take everything into consideration, not bringing in foreign PMETs, especially for the purposes of lowering wages, so we, so that uh, um, we can just buffer the profit margins of, of uh, companies here, that's n not a sustainable um, uh, solution going forward. What we have proposed, over and above that retrenchment insurance scheme, where you're, you're going to have to be able to shore up people and look after retrenched workers. Over and beyond that, what we want to do is to be able to allow some of these people who are retrenched and getting some of these uh, retrenchment benefits for them to come together. So if, for example, you can find some other people who are similarly retrenched, let them come together, come up with a viable uh, business plan. And if that's good, allow them to draw these um, payouts in one lump sum. And then together they can go out and start a, 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 an enterprise, a co-op. Now that not only brings these people back into as, as productive members of the economy, but that you are going to encourage an entrepreneurial class and get Singapore, and, uh, Singapore to be a, a, a truly innovative society. Thank you, Dr. Chi. Uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, you have four and a half minutes uh, to wrap up on this question. Yes. And your time starts now. Thank you, Jamie. This is the greatest crisis of our lifetime. It's not just a health pandemic globally, but it's in fact a deeper, deeper depression than even the 1930s. So this is real, this is a crisis, and this is the crisis of our lifetime. The central focus of our campaign is jobs, jobs, jobs. And let me focus on this point. In order to save the jobs of Singaporeans in the immediate term, we launched the job support scheme. And if you think about it, during the circuit breaker, in effect, the government was paying three quarters of the median wage of Singaporeans. And I emphasize this, Singaporeans. If you look at the bulk of the almost 100 billion in the successive budgets that were announced, most of that, is really focused on keeping our companies afloat. Why? Because we need to keep job opportunities available for Singaporeans, our own people. If you think about it, that's why our local unemployment rate, it has gone up, it went up from 3.2% to 3.3%, an increase of 0.1%. It would have been far worse if we didn't have these emergency measures in place. And then, if you, that addresses employees. We have more than 100,000 self-employed people, and they have also been facing revenue cuts. And that's why we had, for the first time, SIRS, an income relief scheme for the self-employed. Again, to provide them with immediate relief. Mm -hmm. And for retrenched workers, we have had schemes like the COVID-19 temporary support grants, and all that, again, to help them through this period. Now, that's emergency measures, but we need to look beyond. And if you think about it, the only way is productivity, mm -hmm. skills upgrading, and seizing jobs of the future. And that's why we launched the SG United Jobs and Skills Package. And we formed a National Jobs Council led by SM Taman, and if, you, if you've read his announcements, it's all about creating job opportunities. What does that mean? It means jobs, it means training, it means attachments. And let me be a bit more specific and deal with the different segments which you have brought up. First, a young graduate entering into the bleakest you know, economic contraction in, a, in his lifetime. We would say, if you can get a job now, take it. If you can't get a job, continue training. In fact, if you are prepared to take on an attachment with a company, mm. the government will provide 80% of that allowance. You get job experience, the company gets a fully qualified young person at a fraction of what he would cost. The point is to keep them in the workforce, to keep opportunities going. Mm. Then what about the middle age people in my generation, from 40 to 60? And the key thing here is upgrading, skills upgrading. And that's why you see all the focus on SG United skills program, expanding training capacity, subsidizing causes by 90%, providing training allowances for people who want to switch careers into the jobs of the future, and then providing an incentive for employers to take them on. 
you see that again the point is finding those opportunities and facilitating that we also have looked at senior work workers as so long as they want to work and you know we've got incentives like the senior employment credit to encourage companies please take them on these are experienced singaporeans who can make a difference and we want to encourage them to get into the job market so all in all the point is emergency treatment and looking beyond the horizon and that's what we've been focused on jobs 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 thank you very much dr balakrishna i'm going to segue now from jobs uh, into our second question for all of you to answer uh, focus a little bit more on businesses and Mr. Dr. Lim, you get the first answer for this one. Let me read the question. What would your parties do to help local businesses survive this recession, ensure businesses are ready to rebound when the economy picks up and ultimately transform and strengthen the economy? Dr. Lim, your minute and a half starts now. Thanks for the question. And uh, at the Workers' Party, I think uh, we believe strongly that the vibrancy of businesses uh, actually rests in the small and medium enterprise sector. And so a lot of our proposals uh, in our manifesto focus on elements of helping to uplift businesses in that sector. So one example is we are taking up the, the proposal of Export-Import Bank. Now, it's not a new proposal, but there's something that hasn't actually been rolled out. And we believe that ensuring that financing is, is made available to businesses, Singapore businesses, small and medium enterprises, for expansion into regional and global markets is central to helping these businesses also uh, learn by doing and thereby raise their own productivity level. So we think that's uh, one key initiative. Another one uh, is just this idea that we, we also want to look out for the costs that these small and medium enterprises face. And one uh, manifesto point that we have is just this idea of keeping uh, commercial and industrial rent low. And we, the proposal that we have is to have a JTC kind of uh, organization that come in and ensure that uh, rental for these uh, small and medium enterprises is actually going to be capped at a certain rate. Perhaps we would have to end up doing allocation by a non-market mechanism such as a quota system or a ballot, uh, but we believe that this is important to help contain costs. Thank you very much. Dr. Chi, you have a minute and a half. The floor yeah. is now yours. Sure. Uh, you know, Dr. Balakrishnan brought up this whole idea of productivity. I just want to remind people that since 2003, we've had the Economic Review Committee and then the Economic Strategies Committee and of late, the um, Committee for Future e um, um, Economy. Now, with each of these economies, we see our productivity tanking in the last decade. And then last year, we had the lowest growth in a decade of our, our GDP growth of 0.7%. And jobs were lost, we have unemployment going on. Just before that GE right now, you're telling Singaporeans that you want jobs, jobs, jobs. I think that's more an election jingle than an, a well thought out plan. What we need to do is really, number one, lower rental. You have the JTC, Singapore um, mm. uh, land supply controlled by uh, JTCs and your maple trees, sabanas and, and, and so on and so forth, capital land. What we need to do is make sure that, that these um, rents are controlled. The other problem is a foreign workers' levy. These are fees that businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, find it very hard to stomach. The third proposal that we've put up is to make sure that uh, we have schemes like, for example, rest, uh, um, our uh, retrenchment employment uh, scheme, right? retrenchment insurance scheme, uh, and income to the, uh, our elderly people. When they have all this income, it helps them to go out and purchase things, and that helps stimulate our economy. Thank you very much. Mr. Yuan, you have a minute and a half as well. Your time starts now. Okay, I think the most important thing to look at really is the SME issues. The bigger company could weather the storm much better. The SME are the one, and the Jamie and the, Dr. Chi has talked about the important effect, uh, aspect of keeping them alive. The SMEs are now in ICU, so to speak. The key cost driving factors are rental, labor costs, and cash flow and the rest of all the fixed costs. Government is doing something to help them, yes, but how long can it last? The other thing that is very important is that they need to have the business to come back before they can survive. So if I'm a businessman, you can give me all the support now for the next six months. After the six months is up, if the business is not coming back, my business is going to go away. So we need to be able to create quickly help for them 
to reinvent their businesses or if they know the business is not going to survive, they have to do something else. It's no point uh, prolonging the pain. So it's like you, you're out of ICU, you have to do a resurgence policy to help them to nurse them back to health. Getting out of ICU is not the end of it. Actually, not getting back to health is where we want the SMEs to survive. If they survive, the job survive. And in the longer term, to actually create an ecosystem for them, not allowing the GLC to compete with them, allowing them to actually go for government contract, not on the lowest cost basis, but on the basis of they can provide a service so that they can emerge to be stronger company and grow into regional giants, maybe even like the Alibaba and the Google of the world with the R&D support. Thank you Thank very you. much, Mr. Yen. Dr. Balakrishnan, you have the question. Your four and a half minutes as well starts now. Thank you. Let me set the context. Singapore will always be a tiny city state. No natural resources. The only thing we have is the ingenuity, the hard work, the discipline of our people. And I can tell you also as the foreign minister, it is always a search to be, remain relevant and to be competitive in the world. Because we have nothing which is of inalienable value to the rest of the world. So that's one fundamental hard truth. I totally agree with the two of you. SMEs are crucial. They account for 70% of jobs, 50% of our GDP. And that's why, again, if you just stop for a moment and think about what we have done in the last few months, especially for SMEs, right? the job support scheme, it provided an opportunity, an avenue to keep these SMEs afloat. And why? Not just for their own sake, but in order to keep job opportunities available and open for our local Singaporeans. A very crucial point. I agree with you, and if you think about SMEs, what are their chief concerns? Cash flow, cost, credit. So again, let's look at the record and let's see what the government has done in the last few months. Just pay attention to this point. Corporate property tax rebates, not reliefs, rebates, real cash in their hands. Same thing, I've already mentioned the job support scheme. The rental waivers, between two to five months, certainly five months if you're a hawker, and then for the other tenants of JTC and all the other government agents. Again, that is cash. You mentioned the foreign worker levy. There has been both a waiver and in fact a rebate for foreign workers because we know some of SMEs depend on these workers in order to keep their functions going. a temporary measure. We'll deal with that. Mm -hmm. Then we looked at credit facilities. And you know that the government has in fact to, to taken on 90% of the risk in order to, to incentivize the financial institutions and banks to continue extending credit. And in fact, in just the last few months, several hundred, I think it's about $500 million have gone out uh, in, because these credit risk sharing was available. So the point is, I recognize all that, we recognize all that, and the budget specifically addressed all this. But you've made another important point, which I agree with, which is you can't just keep on, on ICU. In the end, our companies, and especially our SMEs, do, do need to transform and have to look at what future opportunities are. And here's the rub of it. Even before COVID, the digital revolution was underway. And one key thing is we need digital transformation throughout all the sectors of our economy. And I don't have time now to spell out all the measures which we put in place, but those of you who've been studying this will know we have supported this digital transformation. Not over yet, not over by a long way. Another point, if you look again in the future, there are growth opportunities. ICT, professional services, digital services, food manufacture, biomedical, healthcare, education, you know that these are opportunities of the future and we again need to help our companies transform and get into these high growth fields. Think about it. What else do they need? The other point is skills. It's upgrading so that our workers working for our SMEs, working for our, and not just SMEs, but also what we call LLEs, right? Mm -hmm. Large local enterprises. Mr. Yen will be familiar 
mm. with that. They are also part of our ecosystem. And that's why we've got the transformation and growth packages so that not only can our SMEs target these new markets, new growth areas, but our workers are equipped with the skills for it. Now, one other point I want to make is that our position as a hub as a city-state where trade is three Talk times our GDP. Your yes. time's going to run out very we soon. We absolutely need to remain open and relevant. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm going to segue now to social issues, Dr. Chi, and I'm going to allow you the first answer to this question as well, which all of you will also address. The question goes like this. How would your party improve social mobility, help Singaporeans who feel they've been left behind, and ultimately emerge from this crisis stronger, and more cohesive as a society. You have a minute and a half, and your time starts now. You know, Dr. Balakrishnan, you and I, we come from the same school. And that school has taught us that we serve others first, before we serve ourselves. And the problem that I see here is that with your government has um, amassed and, and, and focused all the top schools, all the elite schools in um, Bukatima area, right? You remember, Whitley Secondary School was moved out from there. Uh, Swiss Cottage was moved out from there. All to move in SJI, S, um, SCGS, and, and Nanyang, NJC, Hua Chong. Uh, um, everybody's just uh, um, amassed in, um, in, in, in the Bukatima area. And then we tell families that they, if they want to ballot, they come in within one kilometer of the school and they can ballot, uh, apply for, for the children to be in those schools. Now, when you, how many people can really afford living in, in buying a house in Bukatima area? And here's the problem. When you have education, it's a great leveler. When you have a system like this, when you put all your neighborhood schools outside of the uh, Choices District, and then you put all your top schools, you are going to get this widening of not just in, in society, but ultimately in our income divide. And that's not something which we really um, should be going towards. And the other problem is this. We have elderly people not being able to, to even make ends meet, having to sell cardboard. And then you have ministers like you making $150,000 a month. That is simply not right. Thank you very much. Your time has run out, Dr. Chi. Um, Mr. Yuan, I'm going to give you the floor now. And you do have a minute and a half. Your time starts now. Okay. We live in, we, we, we have a first world country, so to speak. Gleaming skylines and all the infrastructures that looks beautiful on the outside. But majority of people are actually third world citizens from the viewpoint of poverty. There was number quoted that you have more than 100,000 households living in poverty, which is about 300,000 people. Uh, something is wrong, basically. How can a country which is so prosperous end up with this level of poverty? Secondly, as Dr. Chi mentioned, basically we have the issue of great income inequality created. So now you have a have and have not. It's because we do not have a really strong social safety net created for the people. People are left behind without. So our party, PSP, believe that the first thing we need to do is spend more money to invest in a strong safety, social safety net. If we have that, the COVID crisis will be easier to handle. Secondly, we have not also spent enough to make sure that the poor is taken care of. For instance, like housing is still very expensive. Healthcare, why are we spending so little on healthcare? You know, the OECD country spends 6 or 8%, we spend less than 5%. We could have taken things like the insurance scheme for healthcare paid by the government. That helps to relief and give them more opportunity to actually, you know, have resources for other things. Um, education, Dr. Chi talks about it, I don't belabor, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a leveler. Thank you very so much. So we need to have that. Thank Your you. time has run out. Mr. Yuan, Dr. Lim, if you could just close things off for the opposition. Absolutely. Your well, and thank half. you. Well, so I'm going to start by thanking Mr. Yuan. I agree absolutely that a very big part of social mobility is ensuring that we take care of those that have already contributed to our economy and our society in the, in the years where they were putting in the effort. So we, need, we absolutely need to take care of our elderly that lives among us. I have shared previously in other fora that it is, it is really a crime that we, we see the elderly continue to feel that they have to work in order to have uh, make ends meet. So that is one of the, the elements of um, social mobility that we feel that, you know, 
elements like a minimum wage will actually help us move toward increasing social mobility. Now, uh, Dr. Chi mentioned as well about uh, education and as an educator myself, that warms the cockles of my heart. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we have moved away. When I was in school, we used to have an educational system where really there was equality of opportunities. But if you look at the schools now, you don't see that. And Dr. Chi mentioned one of the elements where we can actually bring about a greater equality by ensuring that the, the, the schools that are not the elite schools actually get a disproportionately higher mm -hmm. amount of uh, educational spending. Now, the other element which we feel strongly about is decreasing class sizes because I think this, uh, out, uh, ironically, ends up penalizing students that are in large classes and are forced to take lessons, uh, additional lessons out of the classroom in the form of private tuition. Thank you very much. Dr. Balakrishnan, you have four and a half minutes as well to address the question and if you want, whatever has been raised here as well. Your time starts now. We started off as a society of immigrants. Mm. And if you think about that, what it meant was we built it on an ethos of hard work, family responsibility, collective community responsibility, savings, and of course, education. The other point is social mobility. I said we started off equally poor. Yes, it is true in our transition so far, some families have moved ahead. But what is the focus of our social safety net? And I want to highlight a couple. First, we have been very, very focused on uplifting less well-off families. We don't believe in class warfare. We don't believe in sucking it to the rich. We believe in lifting, especially the less well-off, the most vulnerable, in order to achieve the equality of opportunity that you're aiming for. For schools, it's not a question of brand name or otherwise. It's a question of making every school a good school. And not as a slogan, but looking at the real investments which we put in schools. You have worked overseas, and I dare say every neighborhood school of ours is a school that we can be very proud of anywhere. I'll take on any country's schools, as far as we're concerned. So we believe in education, we believe in giving an uplift to children from less well-off families. Let's look at vulnerable families, look at Comcare and all the assistance packages. You know, there are too many to name, right? But you know as well as I do, especially in town, times like this, additional cash is flowing to our less well-off families. Like you can talk about GST, you save rebates, grocery rebates, and this excludes all the local schemes. I totally agree with you. I do not like to see seniors having to work unless they wanted to. And actually, every constituency has the capability to make sure we don't see this. And I want to encourage everyone to do so. But the other point about social security, I hope you agree with me, the best form of welfare is a job. And in fact, there is nothing more demoralizing, more corrosive to the soul than long-term unemployment. No amount of generous unemployment benefits can compensate for that. So our efforts are focused on jobs, 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 and certain key elements. You mentioned a minimum wage. Actually, we're on the same page. We both want to raise wages, but how have we done it? We instituted the progressive wage, not a ceiling, but a ladder. And I speak from experience because I moved progressive wage for cleaners in 2014. Net result now, 30%. Is that is sufficient? No, I wanted to go further. Now, progressive wages at the moment, three areas. Cleaning, security, landscape. I want it extended across the board. We can argue, I think we agree on the aims, it's a, it's a question of how we achieve it. And then, seniors. Mr. Yen, think about it. We do have the best healthcare system in the world. It's not a question of how much we spend, but how well we spend. You think about the Pioneer Generation Package, the Medeca Generation Package, you think about the Community Health Assistance Scheme, available to everyone. 
you think about the schemes, the changes we've made to MediShield Life, CareShield Life, you know, I can go on and on. Again, the point here is inclusivity. We will not leave anyone behind. We will look after our seniors. We will give them the due dignity that they have. But remember, we have not lost our roots and our focus. Mm -hmm. Uplifting people who are vulnerable, jobs and the dignity that comes with jobs and increasing it in a way that does not erode the competitiveness of our economy as a whole so that we can continue to create jobs and good jobs. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Balakrishnan. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. We've certainly had a very good first segment. We will need to go for a very short break now, but clearly you've got questions for each other. So stay tuned for the second segment and for you at home, stay tuned, don't go away. Thank you very much. African Sea Coconut Bran Cough Mixture. Mum? <coughs> African Sea Coconut Bran Cough Mixture relieves cough, soothes throat, loving and caring through generations. The 10th July is polling day. Political parties fielding six candidates or more in this election will deliver their party political broadcast in four languages on television and radio. The first party political broadcast in English will be aired on Thursday at 8pm on Channel 5. This week on KIN. Why don't the four of us go somewhere nice for dinner tonight? Can I? Why not? Oh, what a cave! Are you up for a challenge? Anytime. You're all. Ten dollar fry. <laughs> so, you like Kenneth? Maybe. Kin, Mondays to Thursdays on 5. More episodes of Kin are available on demand for free on Me Watch. Brought to you by Mitsubishi Electric Starmex Air Conditioner. Sunday on 5. A thriving community where every life is connected. One place, a thousand stories. Serengeti, Sunday on 5. Lights Camera Singapore presents in a mall where many people come and go. Everyone is here for different reasons. For my husband. And as diverse as their backgrounds may be, <laughs> the mall is where they become linked to one another. <laughs> Lights Camera Singapore. Our feature film, Gone Shopping. Tuesday at 10.15pm on 5. Lights Camera Singapore is also available on demand for free on MeWatch. Welcome, welcome to the very inaugural session for Executive Insights by MediaCorp. The COVID-19 outbreak is truly changing the way we live, work and play. Because of the current situation, the media across all platforms, whether it's digital or television, radio, it's the consumption is at an all-time high. And there are certain behaviours that are pretty evident which we could capitalise on to create communication that could be strong and engage in engaging with audience. You need to move up to that brand suitability where you've got that inclusion and exclusion. You should do everything pre on the prepaid level and not on the post-paid blocking technology. If that value is created in terms of creating clarity and helping people get their head around how to navigate the situation, I think the monetization will follow. What the consumers are doing today mainstream consumers will be likely to do in the next 6 to 18 months from now.
Welcome back to this political debate with representatives from the PAP, PSP, WP and SDP. Now the format for this second segment is also simple. The PAP will start off with questions to an opposition party representative and in, and in return, after answering the questions, the parties will have a chance to likewise ask a question of the PAP. Up to one minute for questions and one and a half for answers. The other rule is simple, keep the time. Uh, gentlemen, we will start first with Dr. Balakrishnan uh, and a question to Mr. Yuan. Mr. Yuan, let's discuss PMETs. Mm. Are you aware that today almost 60% of our workforce are in PMET jobs? One of the largest percentages in the world. Mm. Are you aware for every one foreign employment pass holder, there are almost seven locals holding a PMET job? Are you aware that the number of local PMETs is increasing by 3% a year, which is in, therefore higher than our local workforce growth rate? Mm. And are you aware that in the first five months of this year, 60,000 foreigners have lost jobs? So my question to you, taking all this into account, what else do you want us to do to fulfill what you started off with? as far as PMETs are concerned. Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr. Balakrishnan. You have a minute and a half. Thank you very much for your question. I mean, uh, the fact still remains that you have, we, amongst us, the 400 over thousand numbers of foreign PMETs working here. And the fact also remains that we have a number of our own PMETs that are out of job to the tune of 100,000. So logic will tell us that our own PMETs certainly could fill up some of the jobs that the current PMBTs could, could do. And the government ought to be helping them to do the transition of getting the assessed quote unquote PMBT to repatriate and our own PMBT getting back to the job. It's a question of getting the foreign company which are used to be running to localize. And you can localize by two ways. One is to create an incentive for them to localize and the other is to create the the stick way of forcing them to localize by quota and, and, and things like that. As far as we know, your employment pass do not have a quota at all. This is one thing that the government should first do. Limit the number of employment pass that comes in. SP's quota should be also be tightened and all the more your work permit quota. Granted, we need foreigners to work here, but our position is that we have excessive number of people coming here at the expense of our own local talent. Our schools produce the best people, but they don't find jobs. That is the issue. Well, your time has just run out. Thank you for your answer. You now have a question as well that you can ask of Dr. Balakrishnan. Yes. I would like to counter ask the question yes. that the government has stated that you're going to produce 100,000 jobs. My question is, what time frame are we talking about 100,000 jobs? Is it over the same year, five years, 10 years? And what kind of jobs you're talking about, the nature of jobs, because you can create jobs that are like social distancing officers, digital op uh, ambassador, which are only temporary. We want jobs for, for our citizens, our Singaporeans to, to be lifelong career. And um, so maybe you can enlighten us what kind of jobs within this 100,000. Well, I, I referred yeah. to the National Job Council led yeah. by SM Taman. Mm. And you read carefully, he said 100,000 jobs. Mm. Opportunities. What does that consist of? Jobs, attachments, traineeships. What kinds of jobs and the time frame within the next one year because we are having a crisis right now and we need to generate those jobs quickly. So we're looking at what we can generate now and if people can't get into the job market straight away, get them onto the ladder upwards and that is skills and making sure that for even young graduates, they can get attachments and we subsidize it. We provide incentives for companies. So this is a clear and urgent priority, I can assure you on that. As far as jobs, we need to keep people away from long-term unemployment, even in the depths of a crisis. So I think we're actually on the same page here. I hope you agree with me. This is something urgent. This is something we have to take all jobs that are possible, mm -hmm. that we can harvest, and we've got to match jobs. Then the longer term issue, however, you talk about lifelong jobs. I'm mm -hmm. glad you brought that up. It is mm -hmm. about skills. The more we can upskill our workforce, and this is not just for young people, but people mm -hmm. our age, 40 to 60, right? Mm -hmm. 
Without that ability to transit into the jobs of the future, we will continually be arguing and cross-arguing at cross, at cross purposes. And I hope I've made this point to you, that we are trying, we're putting real money, and we're taking efforts, all our efforts, to do this. It's run out, but you're going to turn your attention now to Dr. Lim. And you have that minute to ask your question. You know, Dr. Lim, I read your manifesto. And actually, to be honest with you, we could have written the same manifesto. We like that. And that's why people have called the Workers' Party PAP Light or PAP Like. It's almost a position where whatever line or stand the PAP has taken, you basically use that as your reference point and take a half step to the left. Uh, and that's why you, we, we really, really don't have too many fundamental things to disagree about. But even that half step left you need to get your question, has Dr. got fiscal questions. And I'm just asking you, in all the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the little steps left, how are you going to the trade-off with cost and who pays for it? And how do you allocate that cost? Dr. Lim. Thank you. Half. So thanks for the question, Dr. Balakrishnan. I think uh, the kind of meta point uh, yes. that is being asked is that whether we are in fact uh, just equivalent to the PAP. And I think we have often emphasized in the Workers' Party that we do not necessarily object to policy just because of the sake of objection. Ultimately, what we want is the right policy. I think the fact that we're having a debate and agitating toward uh, an answer is a step positive in that direction. Now, you have then went on to say that uh, what we have done is move to the left and the kind of underlying uh, query is that, well, perhaps by moving to the left, we are being irresponsible fiscally. No, well, I, I, I would like to emphasize, within the manifesto, we have under, we have actually done the, the math behind it and everything within our budget uh, is, it actually is budget neutral. Now, what is true though is that it does entail a set of trade-offs yes. and I cannot em emphasize this enough. I think where we re fundamentally differ is where we think those trade-offs actually should occur. Now, the PAP would tend to side on, uh, on the side of capital. We think, in fact, that for every dollar of national income, Singaporean workers already receive an insufficient amount. 42 cents, compare that to 55 cents in Japan, uh, and, and much higher in other high-income countries. And we think that a rebalance of, of that kind of share of labor income is ultimately necessary. Very good. Time for your question now. Yes. So I will likewise ask Dr. Yes. Balakrishna a meta yes. question. Sure. Uh, and, and the meta question is this, you have uh, listed all the policies, and I, I agree with the, the spirit of the policies, which is the PAP has put in one of the largest stimulus policies post COVID-19. Yes. But how much has the PAP actually evaluated the efficacy of its policies? And I ask this in the context of things that were already raised. Dr. Chi mentioned that productivity, in spite of the fact that since 1972, mm -hmm. the PAP has tried uh, to raise productivity mm -hmm. unsuccessfully. You talk about the progressive rate, wage model, but yet, as Mr. Yuan pointed out, we are still in a position where we still, still see we the elderly. We should get your question very soon. And that is the question. It is how much the PAP has actually estimated the efficacy of the policies it rolls out. Because I uh, would have lack of confidence that their big budget mm -hmm. uh, might actually do the job. Well, I think the first point. About the question, the yes. first point is that actually you agree substantively with most of our policies. First point. You have a good question in terms of efficacy. And right now, you are right, we have put aside a 20% of our GDP fiscal stimulus. And you're right, this is unprecedented in our history. And even as an economist, you will know unprecedented internationally. But there is one key difference. We are funding this not by passing the burden to our children or grandchildren, but from our reserves. And you have to ask yourself, how come we have reserves? And it is a question of values. Our pioneer and Medeca generation always believe in spending less than they earn on a recurrent basis. That's why we have the reserves and that's why we can deploy that for a rainy day. This is a rainy day. Now, you, it's quite right question, efficacy, and we need to measure outcomes. Now, let's talk about productivity. Right? 
We're a city state. We have to bring in investments. And some of these, and you will know full well, the nature of these investments, high capital investments, high tech investments, high intellectual property investments, will not generate the same labor share of much of the last industrial revolution. So I think you, you, to be fair, you need to realize, and I think in your own writing, you've acknowledged that, that simply minimum wage does not shift that percentage I have to stop share. you there, Dr. Balakrishnan, and turn your attention to Dr. Chi now, because now the two of you can have your questions, yes. and your minute for your question to Dr. Chi starts. Dr. Chi, we have had many disagreements in the past. Professional uh, ones. Though. Sure. My question to you is, what is the total bill of all the schemes that you are proposing? And in particular, not only the total bill, but how are you going to allocate it to the taxpayers? And specifically, how much and to whom? Now, I know you said, you know, the 1% or reintroduce estate duty and all that, but I think my voters want to know what the total size of the bill is and who bears it. And some of your proposals have got very big holes mm. in terms of fiscal deficits. So please enlighten us. I'd be, I'd be very happy to. I'd be very happy to. Well, we, I think you're referring to our proposals for the retrenchment uh, benefit scheme no, as well as income your, to your question our Jay. income uh, yes. uh, for the elderly. And then we put these two together. We're talking about an annual budget of about five billion dollars. All right. Now compare that to what you uh, just signed off just this year of $100 billion, nearly $100 billion, even if the government did not take in any more revenue, it would take us 20 years for us to uh, spend all the, uh, the budget that you have allocated for just the next uh, year or so. So let's put this into perspective. And I just also want to, to remind you that in, in that uh, when you, in, in the last election, you accused us of being a tax and spend uh, party, right? And that very melodramatically said, compared us to Greece and we'd be going down on the road to ruin. Well, guess what? After 2015, your party started raising prices and taxes on a slew of items, where there's water uh, tax for by 30%, your bus fares, MRT fares by 12%, and so on and so forth, school fees, your, your uh, town council fees. That whole slew of, of uh, um, taxes went into spending, where I remind, remind people that the budget that you blew in the Youth Olympic Games way back in 2010, and then the Auditor General came by and cited okay, this she, government for all overspending and not practicing financial prudence. Your time this is where I think she, the tax and spend uh, policy applies to the PAP more than anyone Your time else. has run out, Dr. Chi. Your question now. Sure. Uh, you know, I mentioned about labor productivity on the decline, GDP growth going the same uh, downward trend, and employment, uh, unemployment in Singapore going <coughs> up. And all this happening before COVID outbreak took place, right? And then you have, on top of that, foreigners, foreign PMETs coming up as pass holders, employment pass holders continuing to rise. And on, over and uh, uh, above all this, Mr. Heng Sui Kiet then comes up and tells in an interview, toys with the idea of bringing our population up to 10 million. Singaporeans are deadly worried about um, this, this proposal. Now, will you categorically tell Singaporeans right now that your party has no intention of raising our population to 10 million by continuing to bring in foreigners, especially foreign PMETs, into Singapore to compete with our PMETs for jobs? Your right, Dr. Balakrishnan, Dr. Dr. Chi. Just today, the Prime Minister's <coughs> office <coughs> issued a statement advising people like you not to indulge in falsehoods. The Mind government you, it was Mr. Gov Hengs no, Kiet that came no, up with the no, idea no, no, of no, 10 million population. No, 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 that's a cheap shot, Mr. G, Dr. Chi. I'll cite <coughs> you the, the, I'll cite you the, the, the interview. That's a cheap that Mr. shot. Heng actually. Let me state for the record, we will never have 10 million. We won't even have 6.9 million. What the government doesn't have a target for the population. What we want is a Singapore core that is demographically stable, able to reproduce ourselves, able to create opportunities and jobs for ourselves, and able to stay as a cohesive whole. 
It is not a target and it's certainly not 10 million and you are raising a false straw man. That is a false statement. And we have said so and we will say so again. So I've answered your question. But since I've got some spare time, right? 28 seconds. Yes. Mm -hmm. On GDP, by any stretch of the imagination over 55 years, it has been an incredible journey. On productivity, I checked the figures. If I ask you, in the last 10 years, when was the ne figure negative? And the answer is yes, last year. Once out of 10 years. As an economist, for an advanced economy, it's difficult. I'm sorry, Dr. Parakrishnan, your time has run out. Okay. I'm very you, sorry. You uh, will have time I'll to up. recap. I'll round up. So before we actually end this debate, I will give each of you now time to wrap up. Dr. Chi, I'll give you a minute and a half to wrap up. Time starts now. You know, we've proposed this four Y, one N, four yeses and one no in this campaign. Uh, what we want to do is to, number one, suspend the GST at least until uh, 2021. And then we want to implement um, the government to implement a retrenchment benefit scheme. And third, we uh, um, want to see uh, the elderly, those over 65, at least the bottom 80%, receive an income of $500 a month. And we also want the government now to put the people first and to make sure that SMEs, not GLCs, are front and center of our, our driving our economy. The one note that we are uh, making sure that we want to put across the Singaporeans is that despite the um, what uh, Dr. Va Balakrishnan just said, is that this is a 10 million uh, population Nonsense. figure that Mr. Heng Sui Kiet said, Nonsense. and I will g give you the, the reference and, and the report he's just repeating uh, that falsehood. he's going to, uh, he's thinking of and toying with the idea because he cited the chief uh, planner at, at URA. Now, this is, these are huge issues. Now, how are we going to pay for all these things um, apart from some of the uh, um, taxes where we want to um, levy, for example, introduce a wealth tax and by the way, I just want to alert uh, Dr. Vala, Balakrishna. This wealth tax, some of the, his party members, MPs, have even agreed with us that some of these things should be, uh, um, should be uh, implemented. So these are the things that we want to be able to do, and we're hoping that Singaporeans Thank will vote much. for the SDP based on this uh, 4Y, 1N campaign. Thank you. Dr. Lim, your wrap-up, a minute and a half starts now. Thank you. So. I enjoyed the debate actually, and I think this is exactly why uh, d debates about ideas for how Singapore should progress uh, should occur. And I think it's also clear from just from this debate that the PAP does not have a monopoly <coughs> on the best ideas on how we should bring the society forward. Now, the PAP has argued that this election is really about uh, giving them a mandate to bring the country out of this crisis. And they need this mandate in order to do so. Now, the truth is, the PAP in all likelihood will have this mandate by the end of this election. You and I think, I think that what, what we are trying to deny the PAP isn't a mandate. Mm. What we're trying to deny them is a blank check. And that is what I think uh, this election truly is about, so that we can actually have this kind of debates, not just in a constrained form over a table, but actually in the forum which was designed for this, which is Parliament. So if you believe, and I call on voters, if you believe in having all voices heard, if you believe that we succeed only when we have sound and rational debate about what matters, if you believe in the essence of a democratic modern society for the 21st century, then we ask that you make your vote count Thank and you, that Dr. you Lim. will vote for the Workers' Party. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Okay. Mr. Yuan, please, your minute and a half starts now. Thank you. Well. I can't agree more with the Jemis. Basically, we believe that there should be free contest of ideas, alternative solution, and constructive voices in Parliament. PSP believes in that. And I agree that from this discussion, you could see that we have the same issues, but we come up with different angles of looking at it. And it's good for Singapore to let, look at issues from different angles and have different views of what uh, could be done better. For instance, for the economy, we have been, over the recent years, obsessed with growing our economic, uh, driving GDP, and neglecting the welfare of the people. We believe that you drive economic growth for the better welfare of the people. So the quality of life is better, not the other way around. Otherwise, we won't have a first world country with a third world group, a third world citizen in this country. 
So economic growth must be not at all costs. There must be the other side, the compassionate side, the social side we talked about. Building a safety net that is for all. We don't have to pitch patchwork giving all schemes if we have a good economic structure that don't need it for the start. For instance, the CPF is soaked up by your HDB saving and healthcare, so much so that you have not enough fund for retirement. If we have good policy, we will have enough fund for retirement from the very beginning, as was intended for the CPF. We can even draw our CPF earlier, and there will be less hardship and no need for all this patchwork of giving Thank you subsidy. very much. Thank I'm you. I'm Dr. Balakrishna, your four and a half minutes to wrap things up starts now. I'm afraid I have to deal with Dr. Chi's falsehood again. No 10 million. Fact. Next point. I don't think you have been open with our people. GST. You are suggesting abolishing it or at least doing away with it for an un it. suspending it for an undetermined yes. period. Do you realize each year at current rates, you will create a hole, therefore, of $11 billion every year? And you haven't accounted for it. You then throw away things like wealth tax. You've mentioned estate duty in your product. Now, in all these things, have a care that you're not actually engaging in class warfare and you're not trying to divide our society. I believe Singaporeans remain a united, cohesive people and we want to uplift everyone. Don't indulge in this. Don't take it out against people who through no fault of their own have been somewhat more successful. James, I completely agree with you and Mr. Yuan. The PAP does not claim a monopoly on wisdom. The PAP is not afraid of an open contest of ideas. We do so in real life, during campaigns, we do so online, and we do it in Parliament. I hope you're aware that whatever the outcome of this election, there will be more opposition members in the new Parliament than the current Parliament. And these members, whether they win the seats or they come in as NCMPs, have full voting rights, including amending the Constitution and voting uh, votes of confidence with or against the government. So we are completely open to this contest because at the end of the day, we're all Singaporeans and we do want a better life. Mr. Yen, actually I object to this characterization that we have many third world people. That's not true. We are all Singaporeans. And as I've said, we've all come up. Now let, let's, don't just take it on faith from me, but Let's look at incomes, real incomes, over the last five years. The median income has gone up by 3.8%. The real income for the lower 20th percentile has gone up by 4.4% over the last five years. We are completely in agreement with you that we need to raise wages. There's no disagreement there. But please be fair in your characterization. Please be accurate in your characterization. And I hope you agree with me. That the only reason we have foreigners here is to give that little extra win in our sales when the opportunities are there. Now, when we're in a storm and we need to shed ballast, as I said just now, 60,000 foreigners have lost their jobs. And all the schemes that we have rolled out now, I hope you agree, it's clearly slanted at Singaporeans. Being a Singaporean, being a citizen, has privileges. So let me just conclude. This is the worst crisis of our lifetime, right? And it's not going to go away in one year. It depends when a vaccine is found. What have we done so far? We've had emergency infusions to save jobs. We have moved four budgets to keep our businesses afloat, especially our SMEs, in order to keep jobs for our own Singaporeans. We have had emergency measures to protect our public health in these measures. We are continuing to accelerate this necessary transformation that our economy has to undergo because of the digital revolution. You asked about problems or slowdown or even challenges before COVID-19. Yes, those challenges are already there. We live in a tough world, superpower ri rivalry. It is a more dangerous world, a more disrupted world, a more divided world, and one where the technology stack 
is being divided, and one where the formula for peace and prosperity for 70 years is at risk. These are the brutal facts of life. So I don't promise any quick and easy answers. The PAP offers honesty, complete transparency. We will take all ideas, we will work with you, you can trust us. So please vote for the PAP. We do seek humbly your mandate and we will emerge stronger and, and more united. Thank you very much. Thank Gentlemen, you. thank you so much for being here tonight. Good luck to all of you thank on you. your campaigns. Um, to all of you at home, thank you for staying with us as well. I'm Jamie Ho. Thank you and good night. <laughs>